Welcome to Global Connections with Robert Siegel, presented by the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center. Our monthly leaders forum addresses vital issues facing society, the economy, real estate, medicine, technology, and science. My name is Dr. Joshua Plow. I'm the executive director of American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, a 501c3 National American Charitable Organization based in New York City. We at AFRMC represent Israel's premier hospital, Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva in Greater Tel Aviv, the leading institution named in honor of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. The hospital is a motto of coexistence as it serves 1 million patients annually from all ethnic and religious backgrounds with the same compassionate care. Please support our mission. Join our community of friends. Visit American Friends of Rabin Medical Center via our website and social media outlets on Twitter and Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube, and on our Facebook page and discussion group. Today's Global Connections topic is Israel's upcoming election. Thank you to our very special guest, Dr. Robert Sathloff of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Aaron David Miller of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and David Horowitz, founding editor of the Times of Israel. And now, Global Connection with Robert Siegel. Thanks, Josh. On November 1st, Israelis will hold their fifth election since 2019. The past four elections have failed to produce a stable coalition majority that can form a government capable of legislating and remaining in power for more than a matter of months. Will the fifth time be the charm? Uh, will it mark the return to power of former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu? And if so, what's at stake for Israel and for Israeli relations with the U.S.? Big questions, and we have an excellent panel on hand to try to answer them. Our first panelist joins us from Israel. David Horowitz was the founding editor of the Times of Israel. Uh, before that, he was an editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post and the Jerusalem Report. The Times of Israel is an English-language news website, and David Horowitz is British-born. He's been covering Israel since he emigrated from Britain almost 40 years ago. Uh, David, it's good to talk with you once again. Good to see you again, Robert. Hi. And uh, before we talk about what's at stake in the election, uh, it, it, it falls to you to explain, or if that's too high a bar, describe at least the Israeli electoral system and how uh, 120 members get elected to the parliament, the Knesset. Okay. Um, I mean, how, how much time do you have? It's, uh, <laughs> it's very, very democratic. Uh, in other words, in contrast to yours and... Uh, the place where I was born, Britain, um, you feel in almost every circumstance that every vote counts. Uh, it's pure proportional representation nationwide uh, with a three and a quarter percent threshold. So if your party clears that threshold, which is tended to be around 130,000 votes or so, so if you get that many votes nationwide, you get your share of those 120 Knesset seats. And as you can imagine, with that system and that threshold, um, you have many, many parties getting into parliament. And in the entire modern history of Israel, uh, there has never been single party government. Uh, there's always been coalition government, uh, which is a very difficult way to govern and is one of the reasons, although it's not really the heart of our, of our current dysfunction, but it's one of the reasons uh, for our, for our um, electoral problems. Uh, we had a, a coalition that took power last summer, early last summer. It involved eight uh, parties. So you're the prime minister. In, the, in that case, it was Naftali Bennett. His own party was only seven strong, uh, and yet he was trying to govern. He had a majority of, well, basically one at the best, 61, 59 some of the time, and it couldn't hold. It's, it was just uh, an impossible, unwieldy, uh, ideologically diverse coalition, united only in their opposition to Netanyahu. And so here we are back in election mode again. Yes, uh, and uh, just to clarify, parties run national lists. There are no districts, as there would be in uh, in the United States or Britain, for that matter. Uh, you don't vote for an individual candidate, although your favorite 
the person you might want to see prime minister would be number one on some party list, probably. Uh, but uh, the number, if you, if you poll roughly 10% of the votes cast, you get about roughly 10% of the 120 seats in the Knesset. Fair enough? Absolutely, exactly. Uh, so as you say, the last election produced this extraordinary coalition, uh, which included people from left, from right, uh, an Arab religious party, I, I, I believe, and what they were united about was Netanyahu. They were anti-Netanyahu. Uh, is that what Israel is so deeply divided about, simply, whether Bibi Netanyahu uh, should become prime minister again, and what is his situation right now? There, I'd say there are two divides, um, and you have to understand both of them, otherwise the, the problems we're having don't make sense. So there's a division, a, a right-left division, which in Israel, it does relate to socioeconomic issues, but it's broadly speaking more fundamentally about relations with the Arab world and especially with the Palestinians. Um, the more ready to compromise, trusting, uh, ready to relinquish territory, the more you, you tend to the, to the left, uh, the more skeptical about the prospects of peacemaking, unwillingness to relinquish territory, the more you trend to the right. Now on that division, there's a clear majority. The right in Israel is in the ascendant, it has been since, um, well, often, most of the time, uh, for, a, for, a, for coming on to, well, about, about almost 50 years now, uh, since 1977, when the right wing first came to power under Menachem Begin, they've held power most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the moment, in that outgoing parliament of 120, more than 70 of the Knesset members are, are people of the right, of the ideological right. And therefore, that begs the question, well, then why is there any issue? Why isn't there a straightforward right-wing coalition in Israel, et cetera? Because there's this other divide that you mentioned, and it's the pro and anti Netanyahu divide. And in the outgoing coalition, in the coalition that, that collapsed and, and therefore triggered these elections, three of the party leaders would emphatically consider themselves men of the right. Three of them, all three of them, had served in very senior roles in Netanyahu governments as ministers in Netanyahu governments, uh, Naftali Bennett, Gidon Saar, and Avigdor Lieberman. And all three of them declared that for them, despite their ideological affinity or affiliation or closeness to Netanyahu's worldview, they considered keeping Netanyahu out of power to be a more urgent imperative. And therefore, you had this bizarre, unprecedented coalition, as you said spanning all the way from quite far on the right, across the center, um, into the left, and including for the first time in Israeli history as an essential component of, of a majority, a four strong Arab party, a conservative Arab party, uh, unified really on, uh, only over that single uh, desire, successful for a year to keep Netanyahu out of power. And why is that? Because Netanyahu perceived abroad as a, or perceived in Israel as well, as a uh, a world-class statesperson, as incredibly articulate and effective uh, articulator of Israel's challenges, incredibly experienced, well-connected, nonetheless very divisive within Israel, uh, also on trial in very, very complicated uh, um, graft allegations, three cases against him, it's been going on for a long time. Um, Gidon Saar, a former cabinet secretary, senior minister under Netanyahu was saying ahead of the last elections, the most important thing for Israel is to keep Netanyahu away because he has been, he, he, power, power has not uh, uh, um, sat well with him. This, this many years in power, Netanyahu, remember, had been in power for 12 years mm -hmm. uh, um, and an earlier three years in the 90s before he lost power last year. Let's, let's focus on Netanyahu's uh, problems, uh, his, his judicial problems first, his, 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 his prosecutions. Um, to, to put it mildly, it's been going on for a long time. This is the, the, the original stories that led to the investigations of Netanyahu were published, must be a decade ago by now. Uh, uh, what, what, what exactly, what is the status of, 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 of Netanyahu? Uh, and yeah, if, he, if he were to become prime minister, uh, could, he, could he take care of, could he fix his situation? Well, the, the cases the cases have been indeed been going on for a long time, not a decade, but he's been under, he was under investigation uh, uh, for some time before the charge sheet was drawn up and the trial uh, um, eventually got going. They're, as I said, they're really complicated cases. Um, you know, this is a, a this was a high stakes prosecution by the attorney general by the state prosecution. 
which Netanyahu charged from the start was uh, basically an attempt to oust him uh, by foul means, since uh, he couldn't be ousted by fair means. And he's alleged that the police and the state prosecution, uh, in league with the opposition and the media, uh, have framed him. Uh, it, they are not open and shut cases. Uh, and indeed, it could be argued that he lost power in part because he was on trial and people you know, may have switched uh, support away from him. So very, very high stakes. Could go on for a long time yet. Uh, in other words, there are hundreds of witnesses. Uh, there's very little cooperation. There's no cooperation. There's none of the normal, OK, we'll trade this witness and we won't call that one between uh, prosecution and defense. No, it's incredibly acrimonious and it could go on for a long, long time. And uh, there have been times when it has seemed as though Netanyahu might be interested in a plea bargain. That doesn't appear the case to be the case right now. And your follow up question, you know, what could Netanyahu do about it all if he came back to power? is a big factor here because his critics believe that if he if he can muster the support and muster the votes, uh, he will attempt to, quote unquote, reform the judicial system and basically find a way retroactively in instituting legislation uh, a la France, where the, uh, the head of government cannot be prosecuted or put on trial in the course of their time in office. Uh, that, that It is alleged by his critics that he would seek to hobble the, the Supreme Court so that it could not intervene. Uh, they certainly want to uh, reform again, quote unquote, the process by which judges are, are chosen mm -hmm. and who's uh, are making those decisions. So his critics, his opponents, including, as I stress, many from his ideological part of the spectrum, believe that part of the danger posed by Netanyahu is uh, this, this uh, um, rehabilitation, he would put it, reform, uh, revolution, uh, undermining destruction, his critics would say, of the judicial system in the process, extricating himself from his legal difficulties. David, there are several other things that I want to I want to ask you about, but for now, just one one last question. We'll return in uh, in the discussion center. Do people anticipate this election to be just as close as the uh, as the previous ones? That is, are we still thinking in terms of uh, at best the low sixties as the the majority that a government will will have? Yeah, that's exactly what people are anticipating. I would just be incredibly wary of any uh, predicting or even assessing. Um, when you have that many parties running and you have you know, more than a dozen parties with, with, with realistic aspirations, and, and about a dozen will probably get into parliament, when you have margin of error in, in, in opinion polls of around 4%, mm -hmm. and when a, uh, an error of much less than that um, in an assessment can cause a party to fall below the threshold and therefore lose four seats, or just clear the threshold and gain four seats, and therefore remake that 60-60 or 59-61 balance, you can't predict anything. Uh, I'll add just one more factor, which is Arab turnout. It, mm -hmm. it is deemed, uh, and I'm not sure this is entirely the case, by the way, uh, but it is deemed very helpful for Netanyahu if Arab turnout is low, and very unhelpful for Netanyahu if Arab turnout is high. Uh, a, a single factor like that uh, can remake the electoral balance. But most analysts believe it will be close. David Horowitz of the Times of Israel. Thanks. Stick, stick with us. We'll come back to you uh, for our discussion period. But, but first, we're going to hear from our second panelist, Aaron David Miller. Uh, Aaron David Miller is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, his focus there is U.S. foreign policy, and he used to practice uh, what he now studies uh, for nearly a quarter century, Miller advised uh, presidents of both parties on Middle East affairs and took part in peace negotiations between Israel and its neighbors. Uh, he previously was vice president for new initiatives at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Aaron, it's it's uh, always good to talk. Good talk to talk with you once again. Robert, it's always good to see and hear you. Uh, thinking ahead to the next Israeli election in November. Uh, what do you think is at stake uh, in that vote for Israel and for Israeli relations with the U.S.? Uh, be before I do that, let me just uh, identify two historical notes. Yesterday was the um, 29th anniversary of the signing of the Oslo Accords. I remember vividly sitting on the White House lawn on September 13th, mm -hmm. um, uh, 1993, thinking to myself that the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict was going to be resolved. Uh, history in reality, pro proved to be very cruel teachers. I also, every time I see you these days, uh, because of the Rabin Medical Center, uh, my thoughts turn to the late Prime Minister of Israel. Um, a life cut short, and it raises the fascinating counterfactual, to me at least, what would have happened 
uh, had were being lived, mm-hmm. would you and I be having a different conversation today? It, it, it's, uh, I, mm. I, I muse on it very often. Look, I'm not an Israeli. I don't play one on television and um, I, I won't speak for the stakes uh, uh, for Israel. I'll leave, I'll leave that to David Horvitz, who's eminently qualified to do that. Um, and, and I'd also say that, forgive me for not being overly excited and over enthusiastic that we're on the cusp of the fifth election in, uh, in three years. There's a certain groundhog day quality to this election. <laughs> to the Israeli political system, which is capable of change, um, although I would still call it uh, predictable unpredictability, um, and its relations with the United States, which frankly under Likud prime ministers, under Kadima prime ministers, under labor prime ministers, under the government of change, has remained despite all the ups and downs remarkably constant. Uh, There are those who argue that uh, we now should entertain the prospects of what I call the cosmic oeve, that the U.S.-Israeli relationship driven by generational changes, driven by um, fundamentally different views on the part of administrations toward key issues that are of central importance to Israel's prosperity and security. I'm not sure I ascribe to any of that. Um, There is still a a very important values and interests, um, confluence of interests here. I, I would only say that I think in, in Washington, um, there is a sense and uh, in the notion that we never intervene in Israeli politics and they don't intervene in ours, mm-hmm. I think is an urban legend that should have long ago been retired. I would argue to you that we do have a stake in the outcome that various administrations, even while they plead uh, neutrality, uh, are hardly neutral. I, I participated in two administrations, both of which interceded uh, unsuccessfully well, arguably, one perhaps successfully. And, and, and you see, how how? Tell us what you mean when you say that. Well, I, I'm thinking of two of two elections. One um, clearly in 1992, when uh, the late Yitzhak Rabin defeated Yitzhak Shamir, then President H.W. Uh, Bush and former Secretary of State James Baker, for whom I worked, um, were very frustrated with Shamir's policies. Um, an intriguing prime minister who managed to fall asleep at the Madrid conference and was quoted as basically saying that uh, he hoped it would be decades before this uh, process succeeded. But Bush and Baker were determined, I think, to uh, make it unmistakably clear where they stood. And they denied Israel $10 billion of housing loan guarantees Mm -hmm. and outflanked Shamir and the uh, uh, American Israel Public Affairs Committee, APEC, in um, managing Congress. Uh, Those guarantees were given three months after Schumer was defeated in Kenny Bunkport. A commitment was made to uh, Prime Minister Rabin. That was one example of clear interference. The second one was uh, during the the, um, initial prime ministry of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, when he ran against Shimon Peres in the spring, June, uh, I think elections were in June of 1996. Clinton, despite claiming neutrality, actually hosted Shimon Peres at the White House mm-hmm. uh, weeks before the election. That w- would be almost unthinkable these days. Well, one last point, but even, even the Biden administration, again, professing neutrality, I think, think went to great lengths over the course of the last year to do nothing, absolutely nothing that would upset the rather fragile balance of the change government under Naftali Bennett. They gave Bennett tremendous margin to maneuver with respect to settlement activity, moving the consulate to Jerusalem, and even on Ukraine, where, as you know, Prime Minister Bennett, while Prime Minister, uh, you couldn't find a sentence which had Bennett, Putin, Ukraine, and condemn in close proximity to one another. So even that was a sort of intervention. I, I think on this one, though, I think we'll probably the administration will do its best to steer clear, uh, but I think their expectations are probably uh, under under control with respect to what the outcome is going to be. We heard uh, David Horowitz uh, very uh, delicately uh, uh, describe the difference, uh, the division in Israel over dealing with with, uh, the Palestinians. Uh, At this stage, can we honestly say the prospects for a two-state solution would be uh, significantly greater if the election came out this way, which would, I guess, be the Lapid way, 
as opposed to that way, which would be the BB way. I mean, I can't predict the future, but uh, the, the, or the headlines, let alone the trend lines. But I think the answer to your question is no. I don't care who wins this election. The prospects of a negotiated two-state solution where the six core issues that divide Israelis and Palestinians are adjudicated in some sort of conflict-ending solution, border security, refugees, Jerusalem, recognition of Israel as the nation state of the Jews and end of all conflict and claims. The, the, the notion that either Lapid, Benny Gantz, Benjamin Netanyahu, or anyone else in Israel, frankly, could lead its country into a negotiation with a divided and dysfunctional Palestinian national movement and huge gaps in mistrust and the absence of confidence on these six core issues, I think are, I think it's fantastical, Robert. Now, it may matter, in fact, with respect to how bad the situation becomes, but to your answer, is it going to bring us any closer to a two-state solution? I would say, I'm, uh, count, count me a no on that one. Okay, Aaron, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll come back and discuss further uh, in, in just about 10 minutes after we hear from uh, our third panelist, Rob Satloff. Uh, Rob Satloff is executive director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and he has been in that position for nearly 30 years. Uh, he has been studying and writing about the Middle East for a lot longer than that. Uh, his dissertation for his doctorate at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, uh, was about the early years of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Uh, in 2006, he wrote a book about Arabs in North Africa who saved the lives of Jews uh, during the Holocaust. It's called Among the Righteous, and he has written... Uh, quite often for many publications about the Middle East, Israel, and U.S. policy in the region. Rob Satloff, uh, good to see you. Welcome. Hello. Good to see you too, Robert. Uh, what's what's the short answer? What's at stake in the next Israeli election? Um, well, there's look, there's quite a bit at stake um, for Israelis. Uh, um, uh, I mean, things that uh, maybe Americans don't don't follow very much, from the uh, the cost of living in Israel to um, education. Uh, issues, uh, all sorts of social issues. And then there are the, the issues that Americans do follow very closely. Um, uh, issues of uh, war and peace, relations with, um, um, with Arabs, relations with uh, the broader world, relations with the United States. Um, uh, so there's uh, 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 quite an array of issues. Um, will they be resolved? Unlikely, if, uh, if the past is prologue. Um, chances that we'll see a sixth election are are, are not uh, insignificant, yeah. um, um, but uh, you can't get to the sixth without going through the fifth. And so, um, uh, how this turns out will have big uh, big repercussions. Setting aside uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's legal problems uh, and and uh, the uh, the scenario we put to David Horowitz before, if he if he were in office, would he quote reform the judicial system to his own benefit? Let's let's put that aside. Is uh, uh, is being pro Netanyahu or being anti Netanyahu? Uh, is 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 that um, what 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 is it about? Is it about dealing with the Palestinians, dealing with Iran, dealing with America? What what? What 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 makes one pro or anti BB? <laughs> um, it's actually a very interesting question because uh, there is you know um, Netanyahu the personality, and then there is um, uh, um, for lack of a better term BBism that has developed around um, Netanyahu over the certainly the last number of years. I mean he there there is very he's a very complex figure. A very interesting figure, historical figure, the longest serving prime minister in Israel. He is, um, uh, on the one, on one sense, it's accurate to say that Bibi Netanyahu is the most left wing member of the Likud. He defines the left wing of the Likud. Um, it's 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 sort of mind bending to put it this way, but what that underscores is just how far right the Likud has um, uh, has trended over the last number of years, and the Likud. Which was for many years, you know, the the major right wing party is now very much in the center of Israeli politics, and there are significant parties, parties that could that could register in double digits in uh, in Israel's parliamentary system, namely getting ten percent or more of the vote, yep. um, uh, that are much much further to the right, uh, much more uh, draconian in their views of relations with Arabs, um, uh, Palestinians and Arabs more broadly. Um, so 
uh, uh, you know, BB is um, has has helped that process. Mm -hmm. He has negotiated um, agreements um, among further right wing leaders, leaders much further to the right to him. He's negotiated unity agreements so that not a single vote um, uh, gets lost in Israel's arcane system where every vote can matter. Yes. And so he's 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 tried to keep every possible right wing vote within the uh, accepted um, voting system. And so he, even if he is the left wing of his party, he is appealing to the furthest right that Israel can produce. I just want to clarify for people who are who don't quite follow this, what it means not to waste any votes or lose any votes. You have to get three and a quarter percent of the electorate to get a seat in the in the Knesset. So uh, just to imagine a crazy hypothetical, if there were if there were uh, uh, five, let's say five left wing pro settler parties, this is very hypothetical. Right wing. And, and, yes. and no, well, I'm 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 being completely speculative here. And and they all poll five. Uh, th they all poll an even three percent of the vote. Right. They get zero seats. Right. So, so to, to put it in numerical terms, party, if you need one hundred and twenty thousand votes yeah. to pass the threshold, and you only get one hundred and ten thousand, yeah. all one hundred and ten thousand disappear. So, if you can bring together four parties, each of which would poll one hundred ten thousand, you could have uh, you know, five yeah. seats in the Knesset or something like. Well, that. You'll have even many more than that. More. Yes. Uh, because um, so so part of what's going on right now in Israel is the forging of of new party alliances. And, 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 and Netanyahu is a master at this. So he succeeded in the last several days in building a huge coalition of the far, far, far right. I mean, the, the people, some leaders whose, whose language, uh, personality, terms, policies would be very far from any mainstream discussion that, uh, um, that would happen between an American and an Israeli leader. And yet Netanyahu himself doesn't subscribe to those views. He just knows that for them to get any chance to have any role in government, they need him to be their standard bearer, and he needs their votes to get over 61, the majority of a 120-seat Knesset. I'm, I'm curious, Rob, uh, is it your sense that the uh, involvement of an Arab party actually in a, in a governing uh, coalition uh, was a uh, a major Israeli development? Uh, did it have any any regional resonance at all? Did people take note in neighboring in Jordan, for, for example, and say, "Well, that's you know, this, 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 things could be getting better over there"? Uh, but what would you say? Look, I, it, it's difficult to say in the short term. Um, I, I think it, I think it was a huge event that uh, um, a gentleman by the name of Mansour Abbas. This is different than Mahmoud Abbas. Who was the leader of the Palestinian Authority? This is Mansour Abbas, a, uh, a an Israeli Arab, a leader of a um, party called Ra'am, um, with four seats, uh, through his support to this current the governing coalition, um, uh, and and did it because he wants to be. He says, "I'm Israeli. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm Arab. Yes, I'm Palestinian. But I am Israeli, and I want to be a full party." I want to be a full citizen. My people want their full share of the, you know, the public pie. Um, uh, we don't agree on everything, but let's work on what we agree on. I think this had resonance far beyond Israel. I think that there are um, Arab voters in countries that, uh, you know, whose governments are far short of democracies, who look at this and say, my gosh, even in Israel, Arab voters are not, not just being solicited, but they are kingmakers. They mm -hmm. can make or break governments. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's pretty impressive. As opposed to actually having a king say, whom you, you might not actually be able to, uh, to yes. influence. Rob Sadloff, thanks. Stay with us. I want to bring back David Horowitz and Aaron David Miller and start. Um, uh, Rob Sadloff was just alluding to some pretty far right-wing parties uh, that... Uh, uh, Netanyahu has helped to to uh, uh, to unify into in, into a block. Uh, David Horowitz, you you wrote recently about one of the figures who's uh, who's part of that alliance. It's uh, Itamar Ben Gvir of the group called uh, Otsma Yehudit, which I guess is 
Israeli strength. Uh, t- tell us a bit about about uh, Ben Gavir. Yeah, Otzma Yudit, Jewish strength. Uh, I'll pick up on on uh, on what Rob was saying. Uh, Netanyahu has united, not in his Likud, but in his block, um, a group of parties, including Ben Gavir's Otzma Yudit. Um, a very a virulently anti-LGBTQ party who he forced into this uh, merger today, and the, the sort of parent party of that far-right bloc, which is called Religious Zionism. Um, so ben Gvir is a disciple of uh, Meir Kahana, um, who was banned from the Knesset and whose Kach party was banned for being racist. Ben Gvir is only able to, he's a serving member of parliament, he's only able to run because he's reined in um, uh, his uh, his previous positions, calling for the uh, expulsion of Arabs, and now he only wants to expa- expel uh, disloyal Arabs. Uh, 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 an assessment that I assume he would make. Um, this is somebody who at- once who once had a photo of Baruch Goldstein, the the, the guy who who killed people in the in the in the cave of, of the patriarchs on the on the West Bank. He once had uh, in his office, I gather, a, a picture of him, which he's... In, in his home until quite recently when it began to uh, look like it might become problematic for him, possibly legally. Um, I, I just want to, I want to elaborate, I want to expand my answer. I'll do it briefly to the okay. question that you asked uh, um, Rob about what's at stake and all the things that Rob said are spot on. But I would say that um, elements of our democracy are at stake in this election and especially um, the independence of our judicial system. Uh, because if Netanyahu has the votes and people like Itamar Ben-Gvir um, will be uh, at his side in this, uh, they will try to remake that balance and basically to create a situation in which the political majority um, fully controls basically everything uh, in Israel without any breaks um, and certainly without the kind of... Uh, um, very, very sensitive uh, balance of authority that currently exists between um, the elected politicians and the judicial system. So there's, there's all the Palestinian issues and Iran, and boy, are those important. Um, and we, you know, we can talk about them if, if you like, but very, very much at stake now, um, that balance. And uh, Mr. Benvir and, and Bezalel Smotrik, who heads this list of the far right, they're heading for 11, 12, 13 seats. Um, they're very popular among um, younger Israelis on the right of the political spectrum. Uh, ben Gvir is a real charismatic, energetic, dangerous provocateur in, in my assessment. Uh, I don't think the polls are going to be wildly wrong. I don't think they're wildly overestimating Correct. the support. And, uh, and, and Rob, you're so right that Netanyahu, in terms of, of his stated political positions is relatively on the left of the Likud, but I, I don't think we can allow him to get away with that when he's welded together this block with whom he will possibly need to be allied if he wants to come back as prime minister, because he's mainstreamed uh, extremist politicians here. And therefore, uh, whatever he may say in terms of his political orientation, and by the way, even maybe do, It's quite possible, depending on the results, that he will turn to someone like Benny Gantz, uh, a centrist politician, and say, listen, I've got enough votes to be prime minister with those far right people, but you don't want that to happen. And I don't really want that to happen. So save me from having to put Ben Gvir in my coalition by partnering with me. But it will be he who has created that what would then be an incredibly difficult dilemma for somebody like Benny Gantz. I'd like to put to to uh, to the three of you some of the questions that that we've received from people who've been who've been listening. And first, uh, uh, I'll ask um, well, I'll ask Aaron uh, about this. Uh, Robin Gottlieb asks, "Do you think things might be better uh, if Israel's uh, Knesset were bicameral, uh, like uh, the U.S. or even England, where the House right. of Lords has some say in matters?" I mean, it's a great question, but it's it's a so far kind of factual. Uh, David could comment extensively, I'm sure, on <laughs> changes in the Israeli political system when they went to the direct election of the prime minister, which was a substantial yeah. Um, yeah. change. I, I would just, I, I refer everything through an American filter these days. That's really where my, my focus is. The Constitution of the United States was amended 27 times in uh, 240 plus years, and the first 10 amendments came as, as a group. I don't see 
despite all of the talk about abolishing the Electoral College um, and any of the other uh, fundamental reforms that would restructure our political system, I just don't see any of that happening in what I consider to be, um, let's put it this way, Aaron David Miller time. That is to say the, the extent over the next 15 or 20 years, let's say, okay? And I don't see those sorts of major changes happening in Israel. Israel has no formal constitution. They, were, they have a series of basic laws. They were wise not to have a constitutional debate because they were fighting for their very survival during the inception of, the, of their state. Had they had a debate over what Israel is, what kind of state it is, where it is supposed to be, I think it would be an encumbrance. But now you look back and you realize, and David is 100% right, um, right, right in this sense, that uh, there are, and I'm not criticizing because I look at the fate of our republic. On June 13th, there was a peaceful transition of power, a peaceful transition of power from Benjamin Netanyahu to Yair Lapid. I wish I could say the same thing. I mean, from... From in Israel then. on June 13th, 2021, from Netanyahu to Lapid. I wish I could say the same thing when it comes to our republic or have the kind of confidence that in fact, yep. uh, we're not due for another very difficult situation uh, over the next several years. So I, the answer to the question is yes, electoral reform or fundamental reform might help, but it's simply not going to happen. Uh, did either of you, either Rob or David, want to comment further on the, this ad, ad, admittedly speculative uh, uh, proposal? No. Uh, here's a question from Sam Hillard. Uh, I'd like your opinion on the following. If BB would not run, the question just disappeared as I was asking, but the question was, if BB would not run, would Likud, and more broadly, would the right easily win a majority election in the parliament? David, what do you think? Yeah, the, I think the answer is yes. Um, it would be a very, it, the situation would be very different. Uh, I think Likud would have won several of the recent elections. By the way, Aaron, I just want to you, the transition was from Netanyahu to Bennett, obviously, and then Lapid sorry, took over. Yes, yeah, but I, yeah. Um, yeah, that I mean, there was there were some little challenges to Netanyahu within Likud. Uh, Yuli Edelstein, uh, former speaker of the Knesset, was going to run against Netanyahu. Uh, because he kept saying, you know, you're not going to win this election. You, you keep nearly winning elections, but not quite getting there. And if I was leading the party, basically almost anybody was leading the party who isn't you, we'd be in power. Uh, but uh, Edelstein was talked out of running. Gidon Saar, the aforementioned former cabinet secretary and minister, uh, a member of the outgoing coalition, utterly devoted to ensuring Netanyahu not return to power, had challenged Netanyahu within Likud and has argued that it is in fact Netanyahu who is keeping the ideological right from power. And if only he would go, all the causes that he purports to champion above all others uh, would be advanced. And therefore one mu must mistrust Netanyahu's credibility. It's really all about Netanyahu. That's the Saar argument. So the short answer to the question, the Israeli right would be in power. It would be a, a uniformly right and ultra orthodox coalition were it not for Netanyahu if the leader of the Likud chose to build that kind of coalition, the Likud would be running Israel straightforwardly and we would not have had several of these elections. Uh, and Robert? Uh, yes. So, so the, the, uh, the complimentary comment to this is um, uh, what happens to, to Netanyahu if yet again, he does not succeed to form his own government? There is a point, one has to assume that there's a point at which uh, some point where Likudnik say, well, how many times can you try and still fail? Um, my, my hunch, and it's only a hunch, and I'd be interested in my colleague's hunch, is that, is that this is it, is that, uh, um, uh, uh, that it's difficult to imagine another time that they will let him. Uh, and I can, I can easily put together scenarios where pieces of the potential Netanyahu coalition break away and say, you know, we've given you three, four, five times, you know, it's time to it's time to move on. Um, I, I want to run past uh, David Horowitz what uh, Rob said earlier about the significance of of an Arab party being part of uh, an, an Israeli government. Was that a one shot deal in which there would be a government based only on being anti Bibi Netanyahu, uh, or 
uh, have, has Israeli politics moved to a new phase where Arab parties are real players and, and, and they will take part in the hurly-burly of making coalitions? It's a really good question. These, these are hard to give definitive, definitive answers to, even if the answer seems obvious. Okay, so Ram was in the outgoing coalition. Uh, Rob highlighted Mansour Abbas. Mansour Abbas is a remarkable politician, somebody who has said to, the, uh, to Israel's Arab citizens, guys, this is a Jewish state. That's the way it's going to be. Get over it. It's not going to change. And we can all either be in eternal opposition uh, or we can try and partner with the Jewish majority for the for our own interests within this country. That's that's an extraordinary things to say. Now he is not universally believed. And Netanyahu, who, who would have loved to have built a coalition with Ram if that would have been possible to to, to uh, achieve power, because he was unable to do that, now castigates Ram and the other um, main Arab party, which is much less. Uh, um, ready to be uh, um, legislating in harmony with the Zionist majority, shall we say, something called the joint list. But Ram, it's really something. And if Netanyahu, after these elections, can find a way to a coalition, and the only way to that coalition is with Ram, the party that he castigates, he would do it. And by the way, many of his supporters, not all of them, and that's we're really into the minutiae because some on the far right prevented him. Uh, from from trying to do that in the past, but he would partner with Ram. Uh, so it's 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 not that the Israeli electorate, as a in its Jewish mainstream, suddenly decided, hey, let's make an Arab party part of sort of the business of government here. It was a function of would be coalition leaders' desperation and the emergence of a party that could be considered kosher, right? To use a word that uh, that Ram wouldn't. Uh, I think it's been you know quite something for Israel to have had um, Ram in, in government. Um, but it was, it was, again, it was desperation rather than some kind of new maturity. And I don't know where it goes from here. I'm not even sure how well Ram does in the next elections. And, and I said something a bit, bit ambivalent before. I'm not sure if Ram clears the threshold and is a potential kingmaker again, that we should automatically assume that they wouldn't sit with Netanyahu. So even the things that we think we can assume I would be wary about assuming them. Uh, Aaron, do you any any thoughts on on the significance of uh, Ram's participation? Yeah, I mean, I think it's extraordinary that the participation of a, a Mansour Abbas, a dentist um, from northern Israel, um, became the first independent Arab party in the history of the state weeks after weeks after the worst communal violence between Israeli Arabs and Jews since the pre-state period. It's remarkable. Again, I, uh, it, I'm i not a glass half full or half empty guy these days. I'm a glass, half fi a glass filling guy. I mean, it was a potentially positive development, which I think augurs well, um, but I, I think that David's points are well taken. Um, and it's way too early, it seems to me, to predict what the Knesset arithmetic is going to look like uh, uh, on the, the night or the morning of November 2nd. Uh, since we've been talking a lot about uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and, uh, and these elections have been largely about whether or not he is to be the prime minister of Israel and as, as David Horowitz, as you've said, there could be uh, and any number of different configurations of parties that he would be uh, okay with if you could make a majority out of them. Uh, I, I'd like to hear about Netanyahu from, from the three of you. That is, that's um, how he, he's, he's the longest serving prime minister in Israel's history. He's eclipsed Ben-Gurion in terms of, of uh, longevity uh, in office. Um, how do you assess him? And we'll start with Rob Sadlock. I mean, how a uh, shrewd politician, uh, coalition maker, what else? Is, is, has he been, uh, has he been, a, has he been good for Israel during his time? What, 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 what do you say about him? Well, um, you know, we, we historians, the, the first answer we'll say is, you know, ask me in 20 or 30 or 50 years. Um, uh, he certainly had um, enormous impact on Israel, especially, um, in, I would say, in a number of arenas. One, I, we tend to overlook uh, in the in, in economics, in finance, in in accentuating the 
um, uh, uh, the entrepreneurial um, uh, 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 the startup nation um, personality of Israel today. Um, uh, secondly, um, in terms of um, Israel's uh, standing in the broader world, um, uh, uh, he opened up um, political and diplomatic markets the way one would open up economic markets and in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, a huge effort to expand Israel's uh, diplomatic presence um, uh, to his credit. Um, uh, uh, subterranean efforts throughout the, uh, the Middle East in the Arab world also um, that uh, eventually reaped um, uh, dividends. Um, not that he was the not that he was the key variable in the Abraham Accords. That, in my view, um, was uh, the the ruler of uh, the United Arab Emirates. Um, in fact, um, one of the one of the rationales for um, the Emirates to make this deal was to stop Netanyahu from doing something that they thought was very dangerous, namely the annexation of territory in the West Bank. But what what Bibi had done in the years previous to this was build uh, important foundations in many Arab countries um, through private diplomacy. That was very important for the state of Israel. Um, uh, on the Iran file, I think it's it's a very gray um, answer. Um, uh, um, uh, certainly a lot of tough talk, certainly a major effort to stop the Obama administration from achieving a nuclear deal that was unsuccessful in the end, although successful to get Donald Trump to uh, to change tack. Um, in the end, it wasn't Israeli efforts that 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 uh, uh, it's 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 undetermined whether the Israeli effort to slow down the Iranian nuclear program will be successful. Um, so this one is is a is a gray answer. So there's some very important achievements some very difficult problems, as David underscored, about Israeli democracy on his watch, um, uh, especially exacerbated over the last um, uh, two or three or four years of his prime ministry. Um, uh, and so I think, uh, you know, we, we, it's going to take some time before history is quite clear on its verdict of, uh, of Netanyahu as, uh, as leader of the state of Israel. Aaron David Miller? You know, there are those who love him and those who despise him. Um, I feel somewhat, and I've made my views on this clear in a, in a, in a sort of balanced way, to, at least to analyze him. I think he's a, he's a prime minister um, who is incredibly risk averse. Uh, I think words, there are words and there are deeds. And there's a, an effort sometimes to conflate them. I think on security matters, he has proven himself to be extraordinarily risk averse whether it comes to uh, taking care of the problem of Hamas in Gaza, pressed by his right wing, whether it comes to Lebanon, and even on Iran, perhaps in a brief period where the Israelis were seriously contemplating a military strike. I think he, he is concerned about military action, obviously, because it, it involves the loss of Israeli lives, uh, but it also threatens, seems to me, um, his own uh, political aspirations, which brings me to the second point, a point that uh, Anshul Pfeffer has made repeatedly. He wants this. Anshul Pfeffer, we should say, writing in, in, in Haaretz. He wants to be prime minister. He wants to be a great leader. More than any other single politician that is operating in Israel today, he desires it more. He craves it more. And let's separate out the indictment for a minute. And he's prepared to do things and make deals, I think, that other Israeli politicians are not prepared to make, simply because of his desire, which makes him unbelievably formidable. Final point, I hear my bias is showing. I think as a populist, whether and whether he's influenced by others that with whom he uh, has commented and dealt favorably, people like Viktor Orban or our, our, uh, our, our previous president. He is, he may fashion himself a uniter, but I think he really is a divider. And as a populist, what is a populist? It's a man or woman who, number one, um, 
plays on cultural backlash and delves in cultural issues in an effort to separate his tribe, his group from the others. And number two, a populist is someone who pushes the mainstream, pushes back on the system. And I would argue to you that he, he basically checks both boxes. Mm -hmm. And I think now at this moment in Israel's history, I mentioned Rabin before, I, I, I think what is required uh, is not Benjamin Netanyahu's brand of, of leadership with respect to healing the divisions or managing the divisions that currently affect the state of Israel. And David Horowitz, you have what I guess will be the last word, and it's uh, your appraisal of uh, your country's prime minister. Yeah, well, Robert, we're 53 minutes into this conversation. You just called him the prime minister. He's I'm not sorry, the prime minister. Me, yes. No, but that's the point, right? We've barely talked about anybody else. Our yeah. prime minister's name is Yair Lapid. Yep. Um, <laughs> we, I think we've mentioned him twice. Uh, Bennett was in power for most of the last year. He's a giant among pygmies, at least that's how he would put it, I think. Uh, he, he, like almost all Israeli prime ministers, maybe Shamir was an exception, uh, came to believe that the, that the survival of the state, or at the very least the well-being, but I think for most of them, the very survival of the state depended on them being prime minister. I think you can say that about almost all of Israel's, certainly recent, but maybe almost all of Israel's prime minister. Um, your point of the, the the points that other people have made about his you know your point Aaron the the the, the will this guy's in his early seventies uh, Benny Gantz had entered politics I don't I've lost track three elections ago four elections ago uh, Gantz is is pictured in his car coming home at the end of election day looking totally exhausted uh, a couple of hours before the polls are going to close Netanyahu is on a, in his suit with his trousers his pants rolled up with a megaphone on the beach calling out to people in the water, have you voted? You know, there's still time to come and vote, right? This is an indefatigable politician. Rob, you think he might be finished if he doesn't win this time? I don't know the answer to that. But he said just the other day, you know, he was asked, you're gonna, you're gonna, gonna quit if you, if you don't win this time. He said, I'm carrying on until the right returns to power. Uh, so that will, that indomitability, um, and then, of course, you know, many of the things that we've mentioned, I don't need to, I don't, I won't, I won't reiterate too many of them, but the economic thing is a really big deal, driving Israeli tech forward, realizing the opportunity there, so smart, so quickly in terms of, of realizing what COVID might turn out to be, very, very sharp, incredibly well read, and terribly divisive, and so insightful, uh, with a C against his political opponents, so delegitimating of his political opponents. Anyone who's not with him ideologically or even practically, you know, is dangerous to the state. That's why you've got so many of his former allies from the same part of the spectrum, who obviously that some of them, and in fact, all of them have their own interests at stake in their political orientation. But with, with a degree of credibility, at least for some of them, that says, no, we have, this is not the Netanyahu of, of years ago. This is someone whose own mm -hmm. interests are now potentially skewing the interests of the state if he remains or returns to power. You know, the people who, many of the people who've worked closest with him have come to regard him as a danger. Uh, and that's, you know, that says something. Well, David Horowitz, Aaron David Miller, and Rob Sadloff, thanks to all three of you. Uh, for taking part today in, in our panel. Uh, many thanks as well to Joshua Plout, Nate Banzani, uh, Ronnie Givigliano, and Adrian Kiss from American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, uh, which produces Global Connections, and also our technical director, uh, Stefan Ben Said. Our program sponsor is the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center. It's a 501c3 national charitable organization. Uh, it represents in the United States, uh, Israel's largest hospital, Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva in Greater Tel Aviv. Uh, the group's website is www.afrmc.org. I'm Robert Siegel. This has been Global Connections, Navigating the New Normal. See you next month. Stay healthy and stay safe.
We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.